Uh, welcome to this first in our showcase series, which the Royal Society of Chemistry Chemical Education Research Group are organizing really to showcase some of the uh, interesting and, and useful work that's been done by members of our group. And the purpose really is to share research approaches and uh, research and foreign practices for teaching. So I suppose uh, I'll start off with uh, welcoming Dr. Simon Rees, or I should say Dr. Dr. Simon Rees, because you have um, recently um, gained a second PhD in education. And I suppose as part of this um, showcase series, what we're interested in is hearing from you about your research and your research interests. And so perhaps we could start off by maybe just talking a little bit about what got you, what your area of interest is and what got you interested in this area. Okay, sure. Well, um, really from when I first started teaching, it became apparent to me very quickly the importance of the language that I was using in trying to help the students develop their understanding of chemistry and how easily they became confused by the specialist languages that I was using. So it was really um, when I got into the position that I'm now in that I was able to develop some research ideas to investigate that further and I started looking into previous work in that area. Uh, for example, the um, work by Wellington Osborne that um, wrote a book about science literacy and um, gave lots of good ideas and strategies to help students develop their scientific literacy, really building on the work of um, Castles and Johnston, who were some of the first people to really identify the challenges of scientific language um, back in the 1980s. And so taking those kind of ideas, I was then introduced to um, like John Stone's triplet as a sort of cornerstone of um, learning in chemistry and perhaps why students find it challenging. And I could quickly recognize how language was central to that in each of those levels, whether it's at the macroscopic, the submicroscopic, or the symbolic. All of these levels have their specific language to it. And it's an interesting activity just to do with a class. And I typically take like a burning candle and ask the students to describe the process that's going on. And we sort of pull apart the language and the words they're using at different levels within that triplet quickly um, come to the fore. So this made me realize that the language was really important to that, those sort of central areas of the, of the subject. And thinking within a sort of social constructivist environment, as a lot of people was sort of talk about, and the ideas of developing um, dialogical teaching processes, all of these um, pedagogical styles uh, require good linguistic skills from both the teacher and from the students alike. If you want the students to contribute and participate in discussions, it's so important to develop their confidence and their appropriate use of the language. So given those really important aspects to learning, I did make the, um, some people say, the foolish decision to um, pursue a PhD in the area, and people say to me in my mind, I want to do that, but of course it was all about um, redeveloping a completely different skill set as an um, educational researcher, and by putting myself in that position I was able to work um, with my supervisor Vanessa Kind and um, Doug Newton as well, and really had the opportunity to learn from highly experienced um, education researchers like that and apply uh, the ideas within my own context. So that's interesting about that point about language. What when you're is is the difficulty that you observed initially with language is that due to the technical <laughs> nature of words or the fact that specific words mean specific things when we're talking about their their use in chemistry. So, so this is what students have difficulty with the word entropy because it's just a word they've never heard of before. It's a technical mm. word. So is it that or is it kind of um um for example, in, in maths, we talk about significant, but that means something very specific in statistics. So, it, so I, I suppose that's just what I wanted to tease out. Yeah, so it's a multifaceted problem in that way, isn't it? So there's the specific technical language, which has specific meanings just in that context of so entropy, you might think it has quite a distinct meaning. It's not a word that um, people will come across in their everyday lives. 
But another aspect which has come out through the literature in the past, well, the work of Castles and Johnston and, uh, and others, where there's the, the dual meaning of vocabulary. So there's words like weak, which might have a very different meaning in the context of a chemistry class um, compared to in your know, everyday sense. So there's several aspects to the problem. And in fact, that's a quite an important outcome of the, you know, the work that I've been developing, is actually that there it isn't just one aspect of that, but I think the most challenging aspects of language is where the, these effects are cumulative. So if you've got words which have um, uh, unclear technical meanings, so like electronegativity is a, is a word um, my students seem to have a lot of difficulty in applying appropriately um, because it's not familiar to them. It's hard to interpret what that word actually means. It's talking about abstract ideas at a sub-microscopic level, so you've got the whole issue of trying to visualize sort of what you're talking about in terms of the distributions of electrons. So it's, it's, it isn't just one dimension. I view it into, in multiple dimensions in terms of the challenge that this presents to students. Okay, so you have sort of identified this area, I suppose, from your own teaching and, and given some context there as to what the general aspects are in that area. So how do you how do you take this sort of general overarching interest and some knowledge and start to develop a research process out of that? What, what, what were you interested in answering, I suppose? What was the research question? Yeah, so uh, in my context I work with um, we call a non-traditional students, so typically mature students come from very diverse backgrounds returning to um, education, so they spend a year in the foundation centre with me at Durham before they progress on to degrees in chemistry or biology or uh, previously medicine, um, different science routes. So of course they come with very diverse and previous experience of, of the um, their knowledge of chemistry and their use of the language. So what I was interested in was what do they come here with and how does that develop as they progress through the foundation year and what sort of strategies are best to um, help them develop their use of scientific language. So my specific research questions really were you know, what level of understanding of scientific language the students have on arrival, how does that develop as they progress to the foundation centre and as they progress into their undergraduate years and is there a role for language focused activities in the science classroom to develop their um, use of scientific language and understanding. So you've got quite a, just, I'm just knowing <laughs> down your questions there, I can see why this takes a PhD. You've got quite a broad, <laughs> so you're essentially aiming to quantify learners sort of current scope of understanding of scientific terms, but then am I right in saying you had some implementation then of, of, of yeah. some activity that would aim to Im improve that? Well, that's right. So that's the crucial thing. So you could imagine someone arriving in my classroom who maybe hasn't done any science for 15 years, 20 years, something like that, and suddenly they're sort of bombarded with uh, all the chemistry that I'm trying to teach them. So very quickly they've got to try and get to grips with um, that language. And is this um, uh, something that is feasible for them to do, or what are the best ways to help them um, embed their understanding of the language and, and use it appropriately. So it was very much um, uh, looking at strategies that I could use to support that. Um, and what, from a methodological point of view, one of the difficulties I had was that it's not like I've got lots of classes of students and where I could have a sort of control group um, and do an intervention with one group and not with another, something like that. I have basically have one class of students, and so uh, I had to test my ideas within that format. So, so can you talk a little bit more about the methods? Then, how, how did you begin to approach answering these questions that you were interested in? So, taking some initial inspiration from the works of Cass and Johnson, basically the large um, multiple choice um, assessment of different. Okay, that's right. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. Um, so I, I, uh, I took some of their initial um, questions to basically to formulate um, a what I call a chemical language diagnostic test. Um, so it tested that aspect of chemical language, and I incorporated other components to it, such as um, 
uh, roots of words, so like prefixes and suffixes, common um, roots to scientific words, to see what awareness students had of that, and that was a focus of part of my teaching, to develop that understanding, because I think that when students develop that skill, they can then interpret unfamiliar words and unfamiliar language and have some confidence. Oh, well, that's got hydro at the start of it, so it must be something to do with water, for example. Uh, so my test basically tested about seven different components of language, including symbolic language, um, non-technical language, um, more um, technical uh, words as well. So I presented them with that on arrival and midway through the year and at the end of the year as well to see if there are progressions in their understanding of the words in that test. So that so, was one so, of the, mm, go on. I just could say from a methodolo methodological point of view, as you say, you didn't have the classic control group or whatever. Mm. How, how are you gauging improvement due to your um, implementation versus just improvement just due to the fact of learning chemistry generally? Yeah, so I don't have a, com a comparison within my, um, my so it's a case study in that way, so I was able to demonstrate improvement. One of the most interesting things that came out was that students with low scores in that test at the start of the year, some of them improved very well and, and got high scores at the end and did well in their in the course and some others didn't and they continued on a low trajectory so it's, it's uh, an interesting area to think about what it was about those students where they did seem to uh, take on board the strategies and and um, and develop where some students didn't so what, what, what kind of just to go on to the results then what kind of um, things did you find for example you, you mentioned a little bit about exploring this idea of establishing an, an awareness of prefixes were you able to observe these things coming through your, your data? Yeah, so um, as you might expect, there was you know, quite a spread in the initial assessment, a spread of, of results to that, and uh, there was an improvement as we went through the year, but there were areas where that was still um, resistant to improvement. So in some of the, the symbolic areas, so if you said, for example, um, is H2O equivalent to OH2, um, still quite a proportion of students were still not recognized uh, and not feel that it was an equivalent. So their interpretation of the symbolic language there is an interesting um, aspect to it. And some of the dual meaning words, so even though we particularly focused on, on some of them, um, they still struggled to give correct uh, definition of some of those words as they progressed further on through the year. But like I just mentioned before, some of the students showed good trajectories of improvement, whereas others um, did not. Um, and so, so, sorry, go on, yeah. Yeah, and this, this correlated with their achievement in the assessment terms of their chemistry exams as well. Okay. So, I mean, this issue, I, I like the idea of Johnson's Triangle because it gives some sort of sense of active thing we can do as teachers. I mean, what, 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 what kind of things can you recommend to those of us teaching who are conscious about language and the difficulty students have with language? Yeah, so again, I mean, this is a, um, a complex area, so there's, there's a, a lot that can be done in that, in that way. Um, uh, perhaps first of all is to make students aware of the kind of um, important vocabulary that they're going to be introduced to. So typically prior to a session uh, the following week, then I would highlight the important language that we're going to be using so the students have the opportunity to, to go away and you know, find out a little bit and familiarise themselves a little bit with those words. And then when you've first introduced um, the vocabulary, it's been clear as to um, the context that you're using that and it's the repeated usage in uh, in language learning one of the most important aspects for students is having the opportunities to use the language and be repeatedly exposed to it. I think one of the real difficulties is they come to a, a chemistry session one week and then they don't again for another week and they won't use that language, they won't be exposed to it um, at other times. So it's providing as much opportunity as possible for them to become uh, familiar with it and be able to use it in different contexts. Which is really... When you say using it, do you mean the, the due structure 
student conversation or is it usage in terms of them listening to you as the lecturer? No, no. So it's very much from a, again, from a, from a social constructivist point of view, the point was to try and develop dialogue and opportunities within the classroom for them to use that uh, language. So I would follow a sort of language teachers kind of approaches of um, different activities in the classroom that encourage them to um, use the vocabulary. It could be uh, word games, it could be um, you know, providing explanations of observations, be it in small group work and then sharing that with the, um, the larger group. Uh, so we had very much sort of focused activities during the, the sessions to develop that. Yeah. So that's the um uh, one apex of the triangle. What, what, how did, do you do you try and interrelate that with symbolic, or is it just the same strategy for the symbolic apex? Yeah. Well, so there's uh, so of course, and so different activities maybe will um, draw on different parts of that triangle. So depending upon what you're you know, what you're trying to achieve. So if you are looking to you know, to develop an explanation of um, an experiment, that just observe and very quickly you'll find go from the macroscopic to the submicroscopic and um, the symbolic will be involved in that. So part of the research that I did was um, I did some scientific scenarios with specific students where they had to um, give explanations of their scenarios. So it could be um, uh, condensation forms on a window pane um, overnight, something like that. So you're looking for an explanation involving states of matter and then and then getting into sort of uh, water molecules and the interactions between water molecules and the the, the energy changes, um, and so over the course of the year, I'd repeat that scenario uh, to see how their use of language was was developing, and if they could get into um, using more of the the scientific language. Wow, very really interesting. Yeah. So, is this it now? You finished now that you finished your PhD, or are you going to move on in this research to other areas? <laughs> yeah, no, I'm very keen to, um, <laughs> to keep it going. Um, and from one of the important areas for me really is, is this idea of language progression. So a lot of the previous work, it basically takes a snapshot in time. It says, oh yes, well we looked at our students and uh, uh, we saw, yes, they had difficulty in terms of uh, dual meaning vocabularies and that, but it's a sort of snapshot in time. And uh, I think one of the really important aspects of the work did was that it, it follows students uh, longitudinally over, over several years in terms of their development and use of the language. And I'm really keen to try and um, pursue that further. But of course, that is quite a, um, a challenging undertaking to to, to do, um, and also in terms of developing these linguistic skills further. So, for example, I've been working on um, close reading strategies with the students this term, because uh, they're typically an experience for them as they progress onto their undergraduate degrees, and they're presented with large reading lists, and they've got um, you know, papers to read, and or oh, read this chapter of a book by next week, sort of thing. And actually, if you ask someone, well, how do you actually read it? Then they uh, can't articulate a sort of um, a very um, skilled approach to that. So I've been developing very much sort of analytical reading techniques with them to try and help develop their uh, way that they interpret scientific text. That's interesting. So I mean, I, I always say to students, you can't read without a pen. But uh, yes. what, what, what? I mean, how do students read from your from your own observations? Well, the typical uh, response is, "Well, I just read it," and so, you know, so there's a complete absence of focus, an absence of um, you know uh, of reflection in terms of even before you read what you're going to read, you know, in terms of asking, "Well, what is it I'm trying to find out, or what do I already know about this?" Um, and then becoming a much more active reading exercise. So as they're reading through it, uh, I had a, a a brilliant experience with just at the end of last term, and they were sort of, they, it was all about sort of um, fraction distillation, crude oil, was sort of introducing that topic, and they were quickly coming up with kind of questions they wanted to ask me, and I was sort of saying, well, you would see if you can, you know, find it in the text, because that's point they're generating questions of what they want to know about, and if they develop that strategy themselves, and then as then reading the text, oh yes, yeah, so that's why the um, fractions come off at different points, that sort of thing, and they're actually having a much more active reading um, experience, and I think getting a lot more out of it. So for you then, this issue of literacy isn't just about um, reactive in terms of being able to comprehend what's going on in a lecture, it's much more proactive in terms of 
equipping them with the skills to to learn it to learn, I guess. Yeah, well, well, that's right. Yes, in the different aspects of it, you know, so they they, they they can get more out of the lectures in terms of their um, being able to follow what they're just talking about equally in their, their other aspects of their studies as well, and they're able to um, keep in touch and and uh, follow what's where they're at. Great. And finally, um, where can, can we read about your your work? Are we able to use this this uh, diagnostic test or? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, if people are interested in um, you know, and collaborating and making use of something, I'd be really interested in in, in working with people. Um, so my thesis is available through uh, Durham University eThesis. Um, we had one paper in chemistry education research and practice, um, which specifically dealt with um, a, a corpus of student writings that we developed, which is an important aspect of of my work. Um, and we use that with the chemistry department to support the student dissertation writing in there. And I've just submitted a paper um, to research in science and education. So I'm just waiting to hear back from them. So uh, fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah. uh, very best of luck with that. And thank you very much for sharing your interest and expertise. I think this will be of interest to a lot of people. I think this is a really a topic that's gaining a lot of interest now uh, in yeah. terms of really beginning to understand what students um, mean when they read, when they talk. And, and so thank you very much. Well, thank you, Michael. That's great. Thanks.